Hello and welcome to today's session. I'm Dr. Roger McIntyre, Professor of Psychiatry and Pharmacology at the University of Toronto, Head of the Mood Disorder Psychopharmacology Unit and as well the Executive Director of the Brain and Cognition Discovery Foundation in Toronto. Today's topic is entitled Redefining the Treatment Goals in Depression, Cognition as a Systemically Important Functional Index, so CIFI. Today's focus is going to be on the cognitive domain of major depression. Our overarching aim in depression is to improve health outcomes in depression. And towards that aim, what we need to do is identify what are the determinants of health outcome. There are, in fact, many lines of evidence that converge and indicate that cognitive dysfunction in depression is the principal determinant of health outcome amongst most people with depression, resulting in role impairment. And as a result of that information, our attention increasingly now is shifting towards the attention uh, to this issue of cognition screening, measurement, preventing and treating the problem. We have discussed during the modular series the importance of cognitive capital. The cost of depression is enormous. This is largely due to the impairment in role function. These are common conditions and chronic conditions. Consequently, the actuarial cost, the economic cost of depression are staggering and increasing and are expected to increase as this digital economy demands from the workforce a complex and cognitive skill set rather than a more simple and manual skill, skill, skill set. Uh, we know from many lines of evidence now that in depression, workplace impairment is a significant problem. And it has been determined that among people with depression, their total depression symptom severity accounts for little variability in the overall workplace performance. A greater percentage of workplace performance and attendance is explained by cognitive functions. This is one of many lines of evidence indicating that it is the cognitive domain that needs in fact to be preserved and enhanced in people with depression in order to in fact result in a reduction in the overall morbidity of the illness. When we talk about cognition, we talk about the FAB4, the four domains being executive function, attention, memory, and processing speed, and all four domains are affected in individuals with depression, not only during, but also between episodes, more than that in the moment. We know that there are two types of cognitive functions broadly. Those are cold cognitive functions, that is those that are not emotionally valenced, as well as so-called hot cognitive functions. And those are the emotionally valenced cognition processes like rumination or negative attentional biases or exaggerated reactions to real or perceived threat. Cognitive impairment is part of depression. Over 90% of patients while depressed exhibit cognitive symptoms. What's more staggering is about half of people with depression in fact have cognitive complaints or objectively measurable cognitive deficits between the episodes. This is a persisting trait in many people who have the condition. In some people it may precede the onset of depression and others it may in fact be a scar of the previous depressive episode. We also know that depression, cognitive impairment is significant. There's been multiple meta-analysis looking at the effect size deficit. An effect size deficit greater than 0.2 is clinically relevant. And when we look at effect size deficits across the different domains of cognition, what emerges is that all domains are in fact affected to a significant extent even during periods of remission. Another way to benchmark the cognitive impairment that we see in depression is to look at other types of intervention or conditions that are known to be affected with cognitive impairment. And what you're looking at is a slide indicating that a blood alcohol concentration of 0.08, which is legal intoxication in many parts of North America, uh, is in fact resulting in cognitive impairment. Not a surprise, we know that it impairs functional outcomes. What we also know is that the overall cognitive impairment seen in persons who are uh, drinking alcohol to the point of a blood alcohol concentration, BAC of 0.08, is similar. In other words, the impairment seen in depression is similar to what we see in people who are consuming too much alcohol. We also know, in fact, that the use of benzodiazepine medications can interfere with cognition to an extent seen in people who have depression. Um, there are many factors that affect cognitive function in depression, age, your um, socioeconomic status, your education, clearly. And there are many factors that we can modify, like illness duration, episode frequency, and illness severity. 
we've had a real, I think, wealth of evidence now indicating that for many people, cognitive impairment can be progressive with each episode resulting in a stepwise deterioration in cognitive functions. This really invites the need for us to prevent episodes. This is a neurodegenerative illness. And we also know that there are many behavioral aspects of depression that contribute to cognitive impairment, like sleep impairment, as well as, in fact, um, addictions, like drug and alcohol addictions contributing to cognitive interference. And finally, comorbidities, particularly endocrine comorbidities, like thyroid disease or diabetes or obesity. Uh, metabolic syndrome broadly has been shown to negatively affect cognitive performance. We now live in a time where we really implicate disturbances in circuits, nodes, and networks as being the relevant subserving substrates um, for cognition. Uh, there's increasing evidence that indicates that the brain needs to work harder when it's subjected to a task one of the brain stress tests is known as the NBAC test. It's a test of uh, working memory. It's an executive function test. And when subjects with depression are compared to healthy controls on this very difficult test, particularly with increasing complexity, the brain needs to work harder to conduct this particular test. This indicates that in people with depression, there's decreased efficiency of circuit, there's decreased reciprocity of circuit, and probably in some areas, there's probably, in fact, a abnormality in the segregation and integration of circuits resulting in increase and decrease connectivity depending on which brain region we're looking at, but the resulting factor is decreased efficiency. So cognitive impairments, they're very common, they persist, they're pervasive across all the domains, and they really interfere with function and PROs, quality of life and general function. The belief system is that we can screen for these cognitive functions, prevent and treat them, we can improve health outcomes. The available depression metrics we have, the HAMD, the PHQ-9, the QUIDs, many others, are just not sufficiently um, endowed with cognitive measures to provide the ecological validity, the complexity and circumstance that cognition manifests, as well as the different um, objective ratings of cognition, so required to have a full appraisal of cognition, and consequently they're just not adequate for assessing cognition in people who have major depression. We need tools that are sensitive, that are specific, reliable, and valid, that are independent of cultural effects and practice effects. And there, in fact, has been a number of comprehensive neuropsychological batteries that have been produced. Unfortunately, most of these batteries are not either freely accessible, they're time uh, demanding, very unwieldy for busy office practice, not available for point of care, they're not patient administered, and often require an expert to administer it and or interpret the results. Just recently, our team in Toronto validated the Thinkit tool, the first ever digitalized, patient administered in the waiting room or at home scale that can screen for and track cognitive symptoms over time. It integrates both self-rated and objective cognitive measures, so important to have both because these are not correlated. Free of charge, of course, is a, a price we all like and provides actionable information at the point of care. Well, in fact, obviate or supplant the need for a comprehensive neurocog battery. This can be downloaded from Google or a search engine onto an iOS compatible or Android compatible device. It's been gamified to make it more interesting and patients will receive a readout of green, yellow, red traffic light type signal where green means that they're performing at their age, sex, and education match control and yellow means there's a half a standard deviation below and red means um, one standard de deviation below norm. So it provides a, an additional line of measurement as part of a broader effort to look at patients with measurement, not just measuring their symptoms, functions, and side effects, but also measuring cognition. Our group in Toronto has also demonstrated that the Thinkit tool not only measures cognition, but indirectly is measuring function as people who have cognitive impairment with the Thinkit measured device also are more likely to exhibit functional impairment, not just general functional impairment, but impairment in work or in psychosocial domains or in interpersonal domains. We know that uh, people who have medical problems like diabetes or pain are more likely to have cognitive problems while depressed. And the Thinkit tool also was able to detect this, greater cognitive subjective complaints, for example, in people who have pain while depression. So my point is that you can use this tool across different patient populations. So cognition is common, it's pertinent to health outcomes. We should screen and measure for cognition using the Thinkit tool. Very few treatments have been specifically evaluated as robust, reliable, enduring treatments for cognition and depression. 
Duloxetine is one of those few agents. It's demonstrated pro-cognition effects, that is pro-memory effects, independent of its antidepressant effects. There's indirect evidence, more secondary evidence, indicating that other SNRIs like desmalafaxine may have beneficial effects on measures of cognition, but this agent was not purposefully studied primarily as a pro-cognition agent in depression. Another SNRI treatment, which is frankly more norepinephrine than serotonin, is levomilnasopran. This agent also has been shown to improve some measures of cognition, notably attention. This, this drug has been particularly studied in motivation and energy and interest where it's been shown to be beneficial rather than in the treatment of cognition primarily, but there are some very promising results. Psychostimulants have been used for decades to treat cognitive symptoms in depression. Amphetamine, dextroamphetamine, lisdexamphetamine, armadofinil, modofinil, methylphenidate. Many of these treatments have demonstrated pro-cognitive effects, but the only one that's been subjected to, the, to rigorous study has been lisdexamphetamine, where there's been beneficial effects seen in both self-rated and objective measures of cognitive function. Recently, modofinil, a single dose of 200 milligrams per, per day, has demonstrated improvement in episodic, in working memory, in individuals after a single dose when compared to placebo. And this aligns with clinical impression. This agent does, in fact, possess pro-cognition uh, properties. 40-oxetine is a multimodal antidepressant. It has demonstrated pro-cognitive effects direct and independent of its antidepressant effects in individuals who are in the elderly population as well as in people 18 to 65 and these benefits uh, translate into improved functional outcomes for those in fact who exhibit or report improvements in cognition. What's interesting is that people who are behaviorally activated by being busy around the house, going to school, exercising, going to work, may in fact be more likely to enjoy a pro-cognitive effect as well as an antidepressant effect from all uh, treatments we offer. But with respect to vortioxetine, it's demonstrated a greater pro-cognitive effect in people who are active in some particular uh, manner. Recently, we've meta-analyzed all of the data looking at pro-cognition and depressants, and what we discovered was that there were differences between agents looking at placebo-controlled trials with evidence of pro-cognition for duloxetine and memory, as well as vortioxetine in executive function, memory, attention, and processing speed. Clearly, however, most of these antidepressants have not been sufficiently studied, specifically looking at cognition, and this, this, as a consequence, leaves us uncertain as to what really would be the actual direct effect of these treatments on cognition. Uh, finally, when we look at the table of cognitive function as a function of the levels of evidence, we see that we have level one, two, and three evidence. And most of the evidence for most treatments in cognition is level three, not quite what clinicians would like to see as it relates to providing best of care decisions for patients. And so what we're really trying to do is really think about very novel ways of improving cognition in patients with depression. Uh, for example, ketamine, which is exhibiting some very interesting, robust, immediate, fast onset antidepressant effects, also has, has anti-suicide effects. And there's a hint in the literature that this anti-suicide effect may in part be because of improved impulse control, that is improved cognition. And that's still a hypothesis to be tested either with ketamine and or with, with rapastinil, another glutamatergic agent that's under investigation. Um, we also know that psychostimulants, and I mentioned earlier, they can improve cognition. This translates into something in the, in the real world because we know that psychostimulants can reduce motor vehicle accidents, bone fractures, as well as traumatic brain injury, something obviously very critical. And it's a very interesting hypothesis that agents that are pro-cognitive uh, may in fact reduce accidental injury resulting in bone fractures or uh, uh, more serious injuries, either uh, by accident or otherwise. Our group in Toronto has been looking at very novel approaches like anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, bioenergetic treatments, as well as incretin-based treatments. In this case, a study we conducted at the Brain and Cognition Discovery Foundation indicating that liraglutide is in fact potentially pro-cognitive and antidepressant. This is a incretin-based therapy for people who have mood disorders. We should never forget the importance of exercise, aerobic exercise, or for that matter, for that matter, brain exercise, so cognitive remediation, as well as psychotherapies, have been shown now to have some demonstrable pro-cognitive effects, uh, particularly cognitive remediation and aerobic exercise. And there's some uh, very emerging evidence that RTMS may have pro-cognitive effects 
uh, in people with depression. We've known for a long time that ECT has procognitive effects, but there's autobiographical memory deficits that for many patients overshadow the procognitive effects. Again, a testable hypothesis with a cannabidiol, one of the cannabinoids, may have procognitive effects, and our team in Toronto is beginning to look at that uh, in individuals who have major depression. One other area is the sirtuins. These are so-called histone deacetylase proteins. They're involved in epigenetic mod modulation. The sirtuins, in fact, may also be involved in cognition. This is an area our team is particularly interested, given the prevailing view among some camps in this field of mood disorders that premature aging is occurring in some people, and sirtuins play a role in the aging process at the cellular level, and we wonder whether targeting these particular proteins could in fact benefit cognition. I made reference to psychosocial therapies, internet-based, phone-based, computer-based CBT is not only effective in depression, but we are beginning to wonder whether this intervention could also be in possession of procognition, independent of its antidepressant properties. We'll look forward to seeing some more rigorous studies. So in short, cognition is the principal determinant of health outcome amongst many people with depression. We need to be screening for it and measuring. I'd encourage you to use the Think It tool. It's free of charge and available online. Uh, we have, in fact, a host of contributing factors that we can modify, like sleep impairment, comorbidity, like excess weight and diabetes. Obviously, drug and alcohol misuse are uh, contributing factors as well. And there's a variety of mechanistically dissimilar strategies that we can begin to think about that may possibly assist our patients who have this particular problem. In the interim, our team in Toronto is looking at a variety of very novel approaches for this particular phenotype. Thank you for joining me for today's program.